Everybody almost there? <laughs> almost settled into your seats, first of all. And then, it's Thursday, right? It's hard to keep track here, isn't it? It's like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know which end is up. How many of you are kind of like that today? You're like, I'm here, but I'm not sure. Okay. Great. Well, maybe not great, but it's a great place when we're feeling weak to know that we need someone else's power to be who we're supposed to be and to do what we are supposed to do. So as we continue to consider God's presence this morning, we're going to be considering God's purifying and empowering presence. God's purifying and empowering presence. Presence. Now remember where the story is going, right? God created a world in His love to share His love with His people in His place, living under His good rules, and all of that was lost, right? And God said, forget it all. I'm going to start over. No. He continued to come after us, even if there were lots of fits and starts along the way. And the ending of that big story, because of what Jesus came and accomplished through His life, death, and resurrection, is that everyone who belongs to Him, everyone who turns from their sin and trusts in Him, everyone who is in Christ, everyone who is that new creation that Josiah talked about a couple nights ago at sing time, Every one of those, every one, if you can say it, every one of us by grace will be with God and all His people for eternity. With no sickness, your voice will never get tired in the new heavens and the new earth. Amen? (laughs) See, you can't even say it. I feel like I can barely say it today. I'm not sure how much I'll be singing in chamber choir today. There will be no sickness, no sadness, no sin done to you or done by you. And this is one of the things that Jesus, by the presence of the Holy Spirit in us, teaches us to love. To look forward to the day when we won't be able to sin against Him or against anyone else anymore. Is that something that moves you? That's something that moves the hearts of those who have the Holy Spirit living in them. That is God's plan for your future. As much as you might be thinking about the future, I can tell you exactly, if you were in Christ, I can tell you exactly what your future is. Maybe not precisely, but exactly. And you're like, that's a distinction without a difference. And perhaps it is. You, one day, will never get sick, will never be sad, will never be overwhelmed except with joy in the presence of God, unable to sin or be sinned against. Nothing can happen like happened in the garden in that city that's coming. God's plan for your future and for your life now is your likeness to Christ. Whatever your life looks like in the week, month, year, decade ahead. I know when you're age, it's, it's maybe hard to think ahead a decade. I'm at the age where you stop liking to think ahead in decades. Let's just do this one. God's plan for your future, like the big future and your future in this life, is your likeness to Christ. Romans 8, 28 to 30 is often talked about as the golden chain of redemption. And we know that those, for those who love God, all things work together for good. And a lot of times we stop there. It's like, yep, everything's going to work out. I'm going to get first chair. The thing is, only not very many people are going to end up being first chair, 
right? Even this week. Not everyone makes their dreams or their goals. So all things work together for good is not great. Everything good is coming my way. Everything's going to be good. I'm going to enjoy life. I'm going to be healthy. I'm going to be strong. I'm going to be successful. So it's all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. And we might think if, if we don't have that memorized, like I'm sure many of you do, but if you don't, he predestined us to go to heaven. He predestined us to be with him. He predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. When God planned to save you, he planned not only to forgive you of your sins and give you a place with him and give you a legal standing before him, he predestined you. He planned for you to look like Jesus. Of course, in this life, that's never complete. We never arrive. We never make it where we totally look like Jesus every moment of every day. But the pattern of a Christian, as we are walking in the Spirit and keeping in step with the Spirit, is to look more and more like Jesus. We're not just forgiven and we stay the same, and the only difference between us and the world is that we're trusting in Jesus, and so we have a hope of heaven. There's a real change that happens in us. And the promise of our future experience of His presence is what moves us to holiness now. The promise of our future experience of His presence moves us to holiness now. And this is the part where you turn. Turn to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John 3. So we've been kind of weaving this story all week, right? Where is it going? It's going to the place where we are in His presence. I will be their God and they will be My people. They will see His face and His name will be on, it, on their foreheads. They will worship Him. There's no temple there. There's no building to house God because He is the temple. God and the Lamb are the temple. There's no sun or moon there because God and the Lamb are its light. 1 John is written to Christians, helping us to learn how to walk as those who belong to Christ. 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3 is what we'll look at this morning. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. You get already the hints of being like Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him, or everyone who hopes in him this way, purifies himself as he is pure. We see the beauty of the gospel in these couple of verses that we should be called the children of God, right? Because that's not who we were. And it hints at that legal standing where we weren't children and then one day we're called children. It hints at the doctrine of adoption, that we weren't and then we were called children. There's a day when legally we were called children of God. But we're not just called children of God. It says, and so we are. We are the children of God right now. If you belong to Christ, you are God's child. God is your Father. Saying, See what kind of love He's given to us, that He calls us children of God. It's not just, you're a sinner and you did the right thing and so I'm going to save you, but I don't really like you and I don't really want to be around you. He calls us His sons and daughters, the ones he loves. 
We are God's children now. But he also points forward to what's coming. Because we don't know exactly yet. We haven't seen it yet. It hasn't appeared what we will be. But here's what we know about that. We'll be like him. And how will it happen? It says, because we will see him as he is. We will see him face to face. We will see him in his glory. And as we see him completely in his glory, we will be changed to be like him. And that's how we're changed to be like him now. Beholding, from 2 Corinthians, beholding as in a, a mirror, the glory of the Lord. We're changed from one degree of glory to the next. We see him. Where do we see him? primarily in His Word. We can also see Him in His creation. We can see Him in others who have the Spirit of God in them. But we see Him in His Word. And He uses that to change us. To make us want what He wants. To make us love what He loves. talked about rules a little bit yesterday. And that rules growing up for me and perhaps for you growing up Felt like just things to be done, often disconnected from their gospel reasons for their existence or the reasons in God's character and will for their existence. They were just things to do and mainly things to not do. And it was pretty much about me doing it. You need to do this. You ever felt that? Like, do this, don't do that. And that feels like the sum of what being a Christian is. We have a longer list than most people. But the Christian life is not about having a little longer list than everybody else in the world. It's about gradually, in reality, becoming who we are in Christ and will be in eternity. It's about gradually, in reality, right now, gradually becoming who we are already in Christ and who we will be in eternity. Because we are children of God. And we're made to look like our older brother. We're made to look like our father. We don't do things to earn his love, approval, and acceptance. We have them already because Jesus has earned them through his perfect life, his sacrificial atoning death, and his powerful resurrection. We are already his children because of His love. And there's even more good to come. So our standing is set. But as we're thinking about God's presence, so there's a future in His presence that motivates us now. But our experience of fellowship as His children can change. Kind of like in our own families, right? For Bobby and Kara, there is nothing they can do that would make it so that they're not my children anymore. Absolutely nothing. They'll still be my children because they just are. Right? You can't change it. There's nothing they can do that'll change that. But there are things they can do that change the experience of that relationship. And because I'm not God and because I'm not perfect, there are things I can do that change the experience of that relationship. Now, God is God, and He is perfect, and so He doesn't do things that harm our relationship. But we can do things that are out of character as God's children. Do you ever have that happen in your family? It's like, you know, I want to do this. All my friends are doing it. Chisms don't do that. Have your parents ever told you anything like that? But we're Chisholm's. And mainly what that means is, no, you can't do that right now. Part of what should motivate us in our day-to-day life is, I am God's. I belong to Him. I am Christ's. He has paid the price for my sin with His own blood and I belong to him we have this relationship because of Jesus and we cultivate our relationship with him 
And there's a way in which this might sound a little mundane, but we cultivate our relationship with God like we cultivate other relationships. How do you cultivate other relationships? You say, this is my best friend. I haven't talked to him in five years. I'm 17. I haven't talked to him since we were 12. But we're besties. Now, if they moved away you know, to a place where there's no internet, then maybe. But aside from that, right, it's like maybe you were besties when you were 12, but something changed, right? You haven't maintained that relationship. You don't have that same relationship. You don't have a current relationship for sure. You don't even know what's going on in their lives. They don't know what's going on in yours. We cultivate our relationship with God by hearing from Him through His Word, by talking to Him through prayer, like He's really there because He really is. Have you ever heard something say, Christianity is not about rules, it's about relationship? Have you ever heard that? And there's some good in there because I grew up with a whole lot of rules and not much relationship. So especially if, if you're kind of feeling that feeling like there's all these things to do and I can never measure up and I can never be enough and I never can seem to quite get over the hump and make my authorities, whether parents or at church or if you go to a Christian school, I can never make them happy with me, so God is really never happy with me. It can be helpful to learn that Christianity is not only about rules, it's about a relationship. But all relationships are also about rules. I know it's early. Does that make sense? Say no rules, just relationship. But our relationship with God is a covenant relationship. It's a covenant relationship. What is that? At its essence, a covenant is a relationship with established parameters, with established limits, a relationship with rules that are agreed to by both parties. I do this. And you will do that. Marriage is probably the best picture of a covenant relationship today. If in my marriage I decided we were going to have no rules, just relationship, my marriage would not last long. Because there are appropriate rules. It's a covenant. When, you're, when you get married, you make vows. You commit to do things. And to refrain from doing other things. And there are things you commit to doing only with your spouse and never with anyone else. If you don't have those commitments, you don't have a marriage. You don't have that covenant relationship. And Paul tells us in Ephesians 5 that marriage, while it's a good gift from God to us, is actually meant, designed to be a picture of the Gospel. To be a picture of Christ's covenant love for the church. And it's a love that acts. In Ephesians 5.25, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, for those in, um, well, I guess we're all in that choir, right? Concert choir? Splenda, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. I know, it's a little slow today. It's all right. <laughs> that she might be holy and without blemish. That is what Christ did through His life, death, and resurrection. He loved the church. And as you are in Him, you are part of the church. He gave Himself for us. His purpose for the church and for your life is to be holy. To be without spot. To be ready to be presented before Him. Holy and without blemish. So rules aren't just rules. And it's hard as a kid, you don't understand most of the rules why they exist, right? They just seem there for opportunities to get in trouble. 
That's how a lot of rules feel when you're young. And parents don't necessarily, and don't need to, because when you're like three, you don't understand all the rules. You just need to know not to run the road, right? Doesn't matter if you understand why. It just matters if you don't die, right? That's what we're aiming for with that rule. When you're young, you don't have to understand them all, right? You don't have to understand what's going on. You need to just obey. And of course, it breaks down a little bit because human parents don't always make good rules. Sometimes we make rules because it makes things a little easier for us. And it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with you or your sanctification other than that you need to do it because that's what we want right now, right? It seems sometimes like your parents make up rules on the spot. It's like, that was not a rule until like right now when apparently you're tired and don't want me around. It's like, yes, yes, you got it. God's rules are not like that. God's rules are not like that. They're not just like how he feels today and maybe he'll feel differently tomorrow. He gives us rules for our good because he knows what's best for us. Kind of like the parent who just refuses to let you play in the street knows what's best for you when you're three. We try to make rules that are for your good. God doesn't just try to make rules. <laughs> he succeeds in making rules that are good for us. He is your Father who loves you and knows what is best for you. And we're called to be holy as our Father is holy. A passage that puts both of these ideas together, these ideas being the future of what we will be, and then being holy like our Father is holy right now is 1 Peter 1, 13 to 19. 1 Peter 1, 13 to 19. He says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, understanding things clearly. He says, set your hope. Where should you set your hope in this life? Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's saying, set your hope on that grace that's coming in the future when Jesus comes again. Kind of like in 1 John, where it says everyone who hopes in Him like this, that we'll see Him and we will be completely pure and we'll be like Him because we'll see Him as He is. Everyone who hopes in Him like that purifies Himself as He, as Jesus is pure. So he says, Peter says, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, who you used to be. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So holiness, rather than just being a bunch of rules that you buckle down and figure out how to keep and cover up when you don't, holiness is motivated by the gospel and the grace that's coming for us when Jesus comes again. And I want to spend the last few minutes talking about how that is powered by the Holy Spirit. Because even if you say, like, I see the reasons, there's sometimes we still don't care. Your parents might have given you some rules and you even know they're good for you. You even understand what they're about. And there's times, I'm just not feeling it today. Right? I'm supposed to be kind to my siblings, but man, did you see what they did? I'm supposed to obey and help out. I've been given responsibility, but I'm, I'm a little tired. Chehi was rough. You know, it might be rough getting home, whether it's Saturday or Sunday. Monday might be a struggle. Hopefully everyone's still on vacation. You can just sleep for a couple days. But the responsibility to honor your parents doesn't go away when you're tired. Right? At least I'm pretty sure there's no extra fine print in there. It's like, honor your parents, love your neighbor, except if it's mildly inconvenient. I'm pretty sure Jesus said that. And so what about when it's hard? Because there's sometimes we understand, right? And our kids know, not actually we can play on, on our street now. They know to look for the cars and it's okay. And none of them are three anymore. 
The desire and the power to obey comes from the Holy Spirit who lives in us. God's own presence with us. You can't do anything for God without God. You can't do anything for God without God. Before Jesus went away, and His disciples were confused, they're like, I'm not sure about this. I don't know if this is what we want to be doing, Jesus. And in John 14-16, to those three chapters as part of that upper room discourse, He told them the Spirit. I'm going to send the Spirit. The Father's going to send the Spirit. And the Spirit will be with you and in you. The Spirit will teach you all things and remind you of what I've said, of what Jesus has said. It says that the Spirit will bear witness about Jesus. The Spirit will guide you into all the truth. The Spirit will glorify Jesus. And all of this began to happen on the day of Pentecost, continued to happen through the book of Acts, and continues to this day. And the Spirit lives in you. The fact that the Spirit lives in you means that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so, in the New Testament letters, we're called to walk in the Spirit, to bear the fruit of the Spirit, to live by the Spirit, to keep in step with the Spirit in Galatians 5. We're told in Ephesians 5 to be filled with the Spirit because the Spirit is the one who enables us to love what God loves, to want what God wants. And where do we learn what God loves? What God wants? Right here. Because yes, it's a relationship, but it's a relationship with established parameters. We don't get to load everything we feel into love God and love your neighbor. He's given us lots of words to load into those words. And it's why we continue to relate to Him daily through His Word and through prayer. And so as we get to go out into another day where perhaps you're tired, maybe a little bit sick. Those coughs were right on cue. Thanks, guys. Maybe you're feeling a little weak. Maybe there's a reason uh, not to give honor to your roommate or to the other people on your hall or to people on a field, though I don't think we're playing Frisbee today. We're not playing Frisbee today. There's maybe a moment where like, ah, the conductor's talking, but I've got important things to say. Are you aware of God's presence in your life personally? Are you living like God Himself, because He does, like God Himself goes where you go. There's a way in which Paul talks it's like God does what you do. Which is meant to make us stop and think before we do things that we know are against His Word, His will, and His way. So are you pursuing the purity that God's presence promises for your future? that you're moving toward the person that you will be. As you practice your instruments, if you have goals, right? If you're like, I want to be in a symphony one day, or I want to be a college teacher like many of our faculty members who are here, and I want to go, and I want to get that degree, then the next degree, and I want to perform a symphony. I just want to get to tomorrow. That's fine. If you have those goals, if you see a future for yourself, like that, you do something about it, right? You might listen to great music. You might watch people play. But is that how you actually get better? No, you practice. You do it. You do the work. Exactly. You pursue it. And that is what we do with the purity that is coming for us. It's, the nice thing about this one is it's guaranteed. So your musical outcome is not guaranteed, right? You don't know what it will be. 
And we don't know exactly what we will look like, but we know that we will be like him. Nothing and no one can stop that. And so we're even more motivated to work. Like if you knew, if I really put in the practice, I will be in a symphony orchestra or in a band or what, whatever by 25. Would you practice harder today? If you know that you will be like him because you will see him as he is, you will pursue being like him now. The outcome is guaranteed. It's promised. It's happening. And God is calling you and empowering you by his spirit to move toward that very good promised result right now. And we can't do it on our own. So are you relying on the power of God's presence? Today, when you feel things that you know, like, that's probably not God honoring, but I really don't care. Stop. Breathe. Talk to God. The one who's in you. The one who loves you. The one who gave his own son for you. Do you seek the guidance of the Spirit when you read your Bible? When you need wisdom? When you can feel yourself not loving God or neighbor? Jesus Christ lives in us by the Holy Spirit, and that is how we live for God. We're not who we used to be. We're not yet fully who we will be, but we move toward who we will be because of who we are already, God's children and God's dwelling place, and because of the promise to finish what he started. To him be all the glory, praise, and honor. Let's pray. Oh God, would you help us by your Spirit to love what you love, to want what you want, and to live as you would want us to live. Would you change us today, bit by bit, as we're exposed to your word, as we're exposed to your glory, as we're exposed to your beauty, even in the music that we're doing together. Would you help us to worship you? And even in tiredness, in weakness, instead of powering through in our own strength, would we cast ourselves on you and find everything we need to live for you now, even as we will live for and with you forever. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.